Good morning and welcome to the 12th meeting of the committee in 2019. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they're turned to silent. The first item on the agenda today is an evidence session on Article 50 withdrawal negotiations and this morning we're taking evidence from Michael Russell, the Cabinet Secretary for Government Business and Constitutional Relations, along with his officials, Ellen Lever, the Head of Negotiations strategy and delivery and Alan Johnson the deputy director for EU exit readiness with the Scottish Government can I thank you all uh, for coming this morning I understand that you're happy for us to move straight to questions uh, so cabinet secretary can I perhaps open by asking you um, whether the first minister has had any response to her letter to the prime minister which she wrote uh, during recess not as far as I'm aware um, I did however speak to David Liddington last night and you know the channels of communication are open but there has been no response to the direct request uh, to take part in face-to-face -face negotiations on the same basis as the Labour Party is taking place uh, taking uh, uh, is involved in now that's a request that has also been made by the Welsh government um, and indeed on a three-way call between myself uh, Jeremy Miles my Welsh equivalent and David Liddington uh, the day two weeks ago today, that request was made again. And you haven't had any response? Well, I, I, I think the response was that we hear what you're saying, but uh, we're not there. You know, I've not been in yeah. London this week, so that does indicate sure. that this is not taking place. OK, to so drill down into that, um, uh, Ben McPherson, the Europe Minister, uh, has written to the committee um, about his uh, the proposals for a, a joint common priorities framework between the, the UK government and uh, the devolved administrations. Have you any idea where we are with that? No, I, I don't think there's been a response to that as yet either. Um, that clearly is a positive proposal. We tend to try and make as many positive proposals as we think will be helpful. You know, we'll move things on that will create circumstances in which there could be agreement, but um, you know, they, don't, they tend to, to fall on deaf ears. Okay. It, can I then drill down into one specific area of uh, concern uh, that has been raised in terms of um, the powers of this Parliament um, as they are affected by the Brexit process? And in particular, you'll be aware that, that state aid was one area of disagreement between the UK and Scottish Government, uh, in particular whether state aid was reserved or devolved. Um, and I know that the Welsh Government is extremely concerned about this. Now, my understanding is that the UK Government has now lodged regulations in the UK Parliaments that would transfer responsibility for state aid to the Competition and Markets Authority, um, which would become an independent regulator. What is the Scottish Government's position on that? Um, the issue of state aid was one of the very few issues, procurement I think was the other one, pr prominent one, in which there was no agreement as to where it sat in the list of frameworks. Uh, you know, the, frame, the, the, list, the long list of frameworks, 153, I think in the Scottish list 111, but in total 153, um, were areas where there was an intersection between devolved powers and European power, or U power that was held in Europe. Uh, state aid is one of, the, one of the rare areas where we couldn't get an agreement what the situation was in terms of whether it was devolved or reserved. There's a very strong feeling in Scotland and in Wales that it is a devolved power. It is not a reserved power anyway, because there, there was no, uh, it was not specifically re referred to in our legislation, and it is not uh, a power that was exercised in the UK. So there was a view that this was a, a matter for the devolved administrations. Now, there are two issues that arise out of that which are current. One is the attempt by the UK to establish a common regime on state aid, which is imposed, not negotiated. Now, we've made it very clear that we won't accept imposition of powers in area of devolved competence, but we will negotiate in these. And we have been negotiating, and there's progress on, on that in terms of the frameworks, and I've given evidence of that to other committees. Um, so a very simple change in these regulations would be enough to cope with that which is rather than to have consultation uh, with the, 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 uh, the, the, the body, uh, the, the setting up of the body, there should be the involvement of devolved administrations. In other words, we should be decision makers in that. This is not arcane because there are some very serious things that arise from it, particularly in agriculture and fisheries, where there are exemptions in state aids. And ex agriculture and fisheries are, of course, uh, wholly 
devolved matters. So there is an, an issue in here to be, re, uh, to, to be resolved. Uh, Ivan McKee wrote to uh, Greg Clark, I think, in November, uh, when it got to that stage, to say, look, we need to resolve this issue. If you believe this is reserved, tell us why. Um, amazingly, he didn't reply. The, you know, instead of responding and saying, this is the case, there has been no response. Uh, Ivan wrote again in January, say, look, you might have missed the letter in the Christmas fun and festivities. So here is the issue. Can we please you know, make sure what we understand your position is? There has been no reply. Uh, so the position is that the secondary legislation was introduced and has gone through the committee by majority, I think on the 10th of April. Um, and uh, you, Westminster Committee, and now we'll have to go to the House of Commons. But this is legislating in an area which we and, and the Welsh, and I have to say, you know, we, we are very clear about this, believe is a, not a reserved area. And that's a very serious situation. Now, you, know, you can have negotiation, but people have got to reply to letters in order to start that negotiation. And the Westminster response to this is to simply ignore it in the hope that eventually, I presume, they will pass the legislation and we will all be fine. So, so, so under the current system, if something's in dispute, um, it, there is no resolution mechanism. They can just do exactly what they wish um, in terms of taking disputed powers. I think most people around this table, no matter their pol political perspective, would accept that the current intergovernmental arrangements are not fit for purpose. There's been endless reports into them by a variety of uh, institutions and organisations, including the, you know, the PACAC committee at Westminster most recently, and they've come to the same conclusion. The system doesn't work. That's why there is a review of, of intergovernmental activity, which has been accepted that that review should take place. Westminster has accepted it, but nothing has happened within that review. And one of the many weaknesses of the system is there is no um, structure for decision-making and, uh, and dispute resolution, or rather, the dispute resolution structure uh, is, the, in the end, the UK decides. In fact, the UK decides whether there is a dispute to be resolved and then decides on how to resolve it. And this was seen most recently in the issue of the additional funding for the DUP, where the UK's action was, uh, reaction was to say, nothing to see here, move along, uh, because it was raised by both the Welsh and the Scottish governments that this was a breach uh, of the standing arrangements. And the UK government said it was not a breach and therefore they wouldn't allow it to be raised in the dispute resolution procedure. And I suppose in terms of state aid, it sounds quite dry, but it, it's, not, it's not actually at all. And um, there's obviously the potential for real tension between the devolved and UK administrations. This, gov this committee, for example, you mentioned agriculture and fisheries, but this committee has uh, repeatedly heard about state aid rules in our uh, investigations into the film industry in Scotland because obviously it was one of the reasons why it was difficult um, to establish a, a Scottish film studio. Now, um, it's one thing pointing to European state aid rules, but um, if it was UK government that was preventing something like that happening, you could see there would be a lot of tension. It is easily resolved. I mean, the frustrating thing about this is we are not disputing that the Competition and Markets Authority should have the role in this. We are not disputing that there should be a framework, a voluntary entered into framework, and that's been our position since the beginning um, on this as on other issues. The issue here is this is not a wholly reserved area. This is not a reserved area, and therefore there needs to be a recognition of that in the regulations. Once that is in place, we have an agreed structure in place. And then we could operate it in the way that many agreed structures are operated. The irony of the frameworks you know, decision, discussions is that there were existing frameworks in place which had operated broadly uh, in terms of consensus over the last 20 years. Out with the JMC structure, you know, there have been practical actions, as there would always have to be, you know, between the two administrations. And that will continue no matter the constitutional situation because there are things that need to be discussed and need to take place. But this can be resolved very simply. But you don't resolve issues by refusing to respond to letters. Thank you very much. Um, did you have a supplementary, Jamie Green? J just one. Yes, just uh -huh. one. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so just, uh, I just want to progress that theme briefly. Um, it does raise an interesting question as to what happens if the devolved administrations have taken a view uh, that a certain 
uh, responsibility is entirely devolved and the UK government has taken a different view, uh, perhaps via legal advice, I suspect via le through legal advice or, or on the basis on the back of, what is the ar arbitration process for actually coming to any sort of formal legal outcome of that? It sounds like there isn't one at the moment, but what would an ideal scenario be where clearly there may be a difference of opinion and it's entirely feasible that that would happen. Um, how do we get to a situation where somebody in a court, for example, would say, no, I have decided this is a devolved matter, that is a reserved matter, or perhaps indeed that's a shared matter? Well, of course, we have a template that could be applied to this um, and is successfully applied where you have a situation where you require to have good relationships based on trust, but you also have to underpin that trust. And you see that in operation, a successful operation in the European Union, where you have 27, well, 28 members at the present moment who have to operate on the basis of trust. And, and Taoiseach has, has pointed this out very, very strongly. Some Last year I heard him speak about this in the British Irish Council in, in Jersey. Uh, you have that basis of trust, but it's underpinned by law. So if you have a situation that countries cannot agree on something, they go to the European Court of Justice. There, are, there is a rules-based <laughs> system, and that rules-based system comes up with an answer, which is binding upon the parties, because the rules are binding upon the parties. Now, that's not what exists in, in these islands. You have no written constitution. You have no statutory um, uh, establishment of the various uh, bodies, and you have no equality in the relationship. Because a rules-based structure also works on the basis that all the partners are equal, and all the partners, therefore, will operate in, in a way one-to-one -one and collectively through the judgments of the ECJ. So there is a, a means by which you could move to this, which would be, first of all, to have an equal relationship, uh, and then to make sure that there was a rules-based structure. Uh, if you were to do it within the current United Kingdom, then you would have to do it on the basis of a statutory set of obligations which are enforceable at law. That would, of course, uh, create the circumstances in which you no longer accepted that one parliament was sovereign, because the issue of parliamentary sovereignty is the issue that bedevils this at its very heart. Because parliamentary sovereignty means, in the end of the day, Westminster cannot be bound by any other decisions. Uh, and that is a problem. OK, thank you. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. So we're at the stage now where the extension's been agreed until the end of October and Parliament is just returning and it's still unclear what the next steps will be. The Cabinet Secretary might want to um, provide some kind of reflection or judgment on where he thinks this might progress over the next few weeks. But obviously we have the Labour Party and the Conservative Government and discussions at the moment still on, ongoing. Um, if we get to a stage where the UK Parliament does agree to the withdrawal agreement and political declaration. Uh, the UK government have previously indicated that they believe the withdrawal agreement and implementation bill would require legislative consent from the devolved legislatures. Um, can you confirm that that is still the case and is there any discussions around how that would uh, operate and is the cabinet secretary able to um, give a... It's difficult because we don't yet know what that withdrawal agreement would finally look like, but are you able to give some kind of um, indications as to how the Scottish Government might respond to that situation? Yes, I mean, I, 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 you know, it, it is a very difficult to predict what will take place. You know, I mean, I, I suspect a crystal ball would be as useful as any other uh, instrument to do so because it is, it is very difficult to see what will take place. But broadly, uh, you, know, you could postulate that there is the possibility of the Prime Minister's agreement being passed and the moving on to the withdrawal bill, which needs to be passed before ratification. I think there is no indication that that can happen at the present moment. Uh, you, you know, whatever the Labour Party position is in these negotiations, it doesn't appear to be one in which there's yet to be an agreement. And it doesn't, we don't know whether that would be predicated upon a people's vote, for example, uh, or not. So I think the, the simple route by which you would say there was an agreement, the withdrawal agreement was passed in the House of Commons, it was ratified, and they moved on um, to, to seek legislative consent for the uh, uh, bill. Would, it would not be our recommendation to the Scottish Parliament to give legislative consent on the basis of the Prime Minister's agreement uh, for a variety of reasons. One is we believe the system of legislative consent is broken, which we've made very clear, and that was obvious after the, what took place with the withdrawal bill and the continuity bill. 
But secondly, because the elements of that agreement are unacceptable to us, and you know, particularly issues such as freedom of movement, lack of membership of the single market, those are all unacceptable to us. So we would not be recommending legislative consent. You then have a range of other <coughs> possibilities. One is that the situation limps on until October, and we go back into you know, the impending threat of a no deal and the negotiation of further extension. That's perfectly possible. <coughs> Another one is that there is a agreement predicated upon a referendum, uh, which is, you know, again, something we will judge on its merits, but we have been in favour of a people's vote. It would depend how that was put together and what the choices were. Um, and the timescales on that are unknown. You know, if there is an agreement the next week, it might be conceivable that you could get that sorted before the 1st of June, though I think it's highly unlikely. If that were the case, then there might not be European elections, so I think cancelling elections doesn't look good for any democracy. If it's not that, then I suppose any date thereafter, as you know, the agreement with the EU is that exit would take place on the first of the month following ratification. So I think you're then looking at 1st of July, 1st of August, 1st of September, 1st of October, you know, and given where we are now, it's difficult to see any of those taking place. But on the substance of the question, there would be no recommendation of legislative consent at the present moment. And it is difficult to imagine in the circumstance in which we are that there would be such a recommendation. Um, but of course, you know, I can't say in every possible set of circumstances. And as you've described that as one possible scenario, what would be the consequences of the Scottish Parliament or other or Wales not agreeing to the legislative consent? Well, the consequences are we would be saying as a Parliament, if that was the Parliament's wish, that we did not agree with the with the with what had been agreed at Westminster and with leaving the EU in, in, in that way. Uh, and indeed, many of us would be saying we didn't agree with leaving the EU. Uh, the practical effect, as, as you are aware, in terms of refusing notice of consent, is it places the onus on Westminster to decide whether to ignore that or not. That is the weakness of the system. That is, you know, um, Jamie Green has pointed out in terms of, you know, in the ways in which you can enforce anything. There's no way you can enforce that. Uh, you know, it has only happened once in devolution, and it happened, uh, you know, with the withdrawal bill, uh, with the withdrawal, um, yeah, withdrawal agreed bill. Um, it could happen again, but it does point out the, the difficulty that exists in the system. Now, yesterday... The can, I, can, I, can I just say, we have put proposals to the UK government in terms of resolving the issue of legislative consent consistently since, for a year, really, um, and there has been no attempt to move forward on it. I mean, there has been discussion at I couldn't tell you how many JMCs this has been raised at, but I'd be surprised if it hadn't raised at almost every single one since then. No movement at all. Acknowledgement that you know this, this is a problem. And I've made the point that this will stymie, in terms of legislative consent, not just a withdrawal bill, but of course bills on specific subjects, agriculture bill, <coughs> fisheries bill, a whole range of, of issues with, were they to come to the parliament for legislative consent. We made one exception, and that was to do the healthcare arrangements, where I, we came to the judgment that this was an issue which would adversely affect individuals, you know, UK individuals in Europe, and we felt that we, we wanted not to do that, so we made an exception there. And there is no requirement for legislative consent um, for secondary legislation in the same way, but we have worked, there is in Wales, strangely, but not here, um, we have worked hard with the UK government on the specific issues of no-deal planning, because that is the, way, the only way in which we could felt, felt that we could protect, insofar as we could protect, the interests of the Scottish people. Um, I was going to go on to ask about no deal planning. In the statement yesterday, the First Minister um, said that that had been stopped or suspended and the UK government had made similar indications um, in the past week or so. While the date has been moved to the 31st of October, there is one scenario where <coughs> we just really ramble along for the next few months and then we approach the same situation in October that we've just experienced in March and again we're facing a no deal um, situation. Um, you have said that you have worked with the UK government over no deal planning so while both governments have suspended it are there still ongoing discussions and even though it's suspended what is the state of affairs between the governments around planning for that? I, I think it's important and thank you for that I think it's important that people understand very clearly what the situation is. The Resilience Committee, which has been the, the heart of this in Scotland, has been meeting on a weekly basis since 
the beginning of December, really, and Alan has been taking responsibility for uh, a substantial part of that. Um, it he did not meet last week, so that was the first week it hadn't met. And the view was that whilst you know, we continue to have in place the arrangements for moving forward, if we had to move forward, and let us hope we don't have to move forward on a no deal, uh, we had the structures and arrangements in place we, in a sense, deactivated them. We froze them where they were. Uh, we didn't intensify them. If we'd gone into a no-deal situation two weeks ago, then the Bilson Glen control room that the police and first responders were responsible for would have gone on to 24-hour operation. There would have been a cycle of activity, a daily cycle of activity through the resilience structure, which would have been you know, a very close liaison with the other countries of, of these islands and a decision-making uh, process that would have been in place starting with the you know, meetings of officials in the early hours and, and moving through. It's very clear plans of how this work. Uh, work on, well, stock planning took place, of course. So there are some issues now to be addressed in terms of what you do and, and how you unstockpile and then restockpile if you would have to do so. But we just stopped that. It's there, it can be activated, and we will activate it should you require to do so. That will be a judgment that, that takes place. But equally, we should take the opportunity of, of assessing what we have done to see whether we feel that was right or adequate and if there's more to be done. So at some stage over the next few weeks, uh, we will, uh, as, you know, as ministers, working with the resilience team, with senior officials and, and, and with the responders, and through the, the, the resilience partnerships that exist throughout Scotland. How many are there of them? I can't remember. Uh, maybe nine? No, uh, no, nine or so. I mean, we can confirm that with the resilience partnerships around Scotland. We will review what took place. And we will say, have we learned things from this that we can improve uh, if we have to do this again? In terms of the UK, uh, the UK has broadly done the same thing. Uh, we had... The First Minister was invited to take part in the UK subcom Cabinet subcommittee on preparations for a no deal. I represented the First Minister that, I think, on three or four occasions. Mr. Swinney was there on a couple of occasions. The First Minister herself went in the beginning of April, I think, uh, for that. Uh, so the three of us have, 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 have uh, played a role in that. And there was then established something called a small ministerial group, which was essentially their executive group based on that. And I took part in a telephone meeting of that um, at the beginning of April. Um, and that, again, was a UK cabinet subcommittee. And, that, and that's been something that's never happened before. So that indicates the, the, the way in which there was work across the administrations. And I think for a number of good reasons, primarily because I don't think, to be honest, the UK government could deliver in Scotland in the way that we can deliver in Scotland, and they recognise that. And therefore, we had to work closely together. Equally, there was no sense in us running a parallel stockpiling operation if we didn't have to, although there were things we needed to do which they didn't do. There is a difference in the formulary between Scotland and England of about 16%, I think, and therefore there were some things that we would need that they didn't use, and there were some different arrangements in consumables and, and clinical um, supplies which needed to be dealt with. And there were some issues on supply chains, for example, which we would need to be mindful of. You know, as the MSP for Argyll and Butte, I am very aware that supply chains come to an end you know, on the islands in the west and the islands in the north, Mr. Scott will be aware of that. And as a result of that, there needed to be some special arrangements. And there are issues of exporting, for example, um, seafood and, and fish, which required to be looked at. So there were things, special things happening here, but there was also cooperation elsewhere. And with Wales, I have to say, uh, Mark Drakeford, um, who was my counterpart, who's now the First Minister, had attended uh, a number of the subcommittees uh, and has had... Jeremy Miles, the Welsh Council General, who also deals with Brexit. And while I agree that it's been vital, uh, it's been necessary to prepare for a no-deal situation, while no deal remains on the table as an option, um, have the Scottish Government made any evaluation of what kind of cost this has involved? Um, we are in the process of doing so. I I'm sure you would agree that the important thing was to do it. Uh, but, uh, indeed, I had a conversation about that this very morning. Uh, I, I am very keen to see a further evaluation of cost. Of course, you, governments do not tend to cost individual activity like that, but I think we do need a clearer understanding of what 
a considerable expense has been gone to. I mean, there are some examples. You know, the, 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 the Chief Constable has indicated that I think there's an additional cost of £19 million uh, in this current year that has been incurred as a result of this activity. You know, but we will, I hope, be able to come to a firmer and clearer estimate in the fullness of time. That's one of the things we'll be working on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Green. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, just a few uh, questions of differing sorts. Um, can I uh, pick up on the yesterday's statement by the First Minister? Um, I was of the view that perhaps you, uh, Cabinet Secretary, would be the lead contact uh, with regards to these cross-party discussions around the future, uh, potential future for Scotland. I just wondered if you could perhaps update the committee as to the nature of what these discussions might be, how parties might participate in, in them, uh, and uh, just a general overview of, as to the purpose and outcome of what you think those discussions might be. I'm not going to predict the outcome of such discussions. The First Minister made it absolutely clear yesterday that she is uh, entirely open and that will be the spirit in which I enter into it. The First Minister, I think, has written to the party leaders, um, inviting them to take part in this, and um, I will shortly uh, contact them to seek initial meetings. I want this to be an open and uh, constructive process. I'll take external advice on the process. Um, I will try and find a way in which we can enter into dialogue. Some people may choose not to, some people may choose to. I hope people will do, and I, I look forward to it. But what's the point of the discussion? Uh, because what nobody, nobody has a monopoly of wisdom, neither the government nor the political parties. But what is it you want to discuss? Uh, well, I want to discuss what ideas, you know the ideas we have, what ideas do the other parties have in terms of the necessary changes uh, for, to repair what is a badly broken system. I mean, unless you believe that the system is not badly broken, then I would have thought, as your colleague Murdo Fraser has brought forward, there will be people with ideas who will say um, there are things that need to change. I'm very keen to hear them. They, you know, I think Scotland is keen to hear them. But surely you and the First Minister's outcome is independence for Scotland. So how do you think cross-party talks are going to help you achieve that? Well, I, I think what you are doing here is, is, is creating a set of circumstances which has led to the problems that we have, with the greatest respect, for example, with Brexit. Because I think it is important that we put on the table and we are able to exchange views on diverse views of, of what our future is. I think the problems that we've experiencing, the terrible problems we've experienced with Brexit, come as a result of not being able to have dialogue. That's why we've both got the cross-party talks and we want to take forward the idea of a citizens' assembly, which personally I'm very enthusiastic about because I've seen how it's worked elsewhere. And this is an opportunity for us to have constructive, respectful dialogue in a time when that is difficult. And I you know, freely acknowledge that in a time when that is difficult, in an age of extremes where everything seems extreme, I think it is important that we try to do that. And I think the First Minister was very clear about that yesterday. And therefore, I think it's also important not to rush to judgment on it. You know, I, I appreciate that the first view of some people may be to say, no, no, we're having nothing to do with this. This is completely pointless. We're not, we're not doing it. I just want to take a bit of time to step back from that. And, and I hope others might want to as well. So presumably then all potential outcomes are on the table. First Minister said that yesterday in response to a question from Miles Briggs. Okay. Can I move on to a different question of a different nature? And that's, uh, First Minister said yesterday, I think repeatedly, uh, the phrase that independence is the only way to secure Scotland's future in the European Union. Um, Cabinet Secretary, could you just outline to the committee what criteria Scotland would need to meet to become a member of the European Union? Uh, how much of that criteria you currently think that we meet and what conversations you or the First Minister have had with the European Union with regards to Scotland's potential membership? Well, first of all, it has to be show that it, there's no queue to join the European Union, as you know. Uh, you have to observe the acquis. Now, Scotland has observed the acquis in terms of its institutions and its uh, actions uh, over the last 45 years. So to that extent, it qualifies. It doesn't stand outside. There are then a range of discussions you would have with the EU about institutions and how you would go forward. Those are not discussions we are able to have now because uh, we are not a, 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 in that position. We are part of another member state. That does not take place. I think nobody would deny that the atmosphere has changed since Brexit. 
I don't think anybody who spends any time in Brussels would be in the slightest doubt that there was tremendous goodwill towards Scotland. But there would be, and John Kerr has said this, and you know, he, he is the author of Article 50. He believes that the accession process would be the fastest on record. And I noticed today, for example, a, a French uh, 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 MP uh, tweeting about the fact that he hopes France will change its view from 2014 and be very constructive and there should be no uh, delaying. This will be a matter for negotiation and discussion. What I think is absolutely clear is that Scotland is no different from any other small country in Europe and therefore will be is fully able to be a member of the EU if it is an independent state. We will then take that forward step by step. But the first one is using language that is almost guaranteed uh, and that's the premise on which she made her statement yesterday. My original question, and I'm happy to repeat it, is what is the criteria? Do we currently meet that criteria or not? And what conversations have you had? And it sounds like none. What you answer. want to do, Mr Green, with the greatest respect, is, is to get us to the situation, and Mr Scott is now joining in this, so I'm happy to have that d dialogue. Uh, you want to get to the situation in which in some way, Scotland is uniquely unqualified to be a I'm member of the EU. I'm asking a very EU simple question about and, what, what you and, think the rules are and, and whether we meet them or not. uniquely unqualified to be a member of the EU and therefore will stand outside. There is no evidence of that whatsoever. There is a process to be gone through. Which is Scotland what? is fully capable of going through that process in the same way as all other European countries have. I had a fascinating conversation with a group of judges in the uh, European court some time ago. And one of them who had been a, a, a very key activist in accession for their particular country, I won't say what it was, said, what Brexit is, is essentially the process of de-accession. You, know, you unravel the process. Uh, what any country that joins has to do is to go through the process. And, and one accepts that that is the process you go through. But Scotland has been in there you know, as part of a member state for all this period of time. There is absolutely no doubt that it can be a full member of the EU. It will qualify to be so. And I think anybody who throws doubt upon that doesn't actually know very much about the EU. Uh, with the greatest respect, I'm not throwing doubt, I'm asking you very simple questions about what conversations you've had about Scotland's eligibility. And I am in no, 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 in no doubt from the conversations I have had in Brussels, I and my colleagues, that Scotland is able, willing, and will be a member of the EU through a process of accession. Okay, thank you, Convener. Uh, and could you, uh, if not today, write to the committee with the specific details of the meetings that you've had on the question that Jamie Green's just asked? I, I can certainly write to the committee about the discussions that take place, but I'm not going to go through day by day a process which is designed to say, you haven't asked, and therefore you can't It's not what I asked, Mr. Russell. We I just asked for a simple list of the dates in which you have had the discussions uh, and presumably other minister colleagues that Mr. Green has just been asking about. It's a very simple request. And, and you, know, you know, as the committee knows, because it knows, uh, it, because they are, you are experts on this matter, you know the EU will not enter into formal discussions not what I'm asking. with any uh, country until that process starts, particularly a third part of a, a, a member state. There is no doubt that the atmosphere of this is different and there is no doubt that when those conversations take place, sometimes confidential, then those con conversations lead to the conclusion that this is not a difficult process. So is, will we get a letter from the government I saying I shall when consider what information in the light of confidential discussions I can give and I will be as transparent as I can be. But I, I am in no doubt, and therefore that is the evidence I am giving you, I am in no doubt that this is a process that can be successfully entered into and successfully concluded. In fairness, that wasn't what I was asking, but um, your answer stands on the record, of course. Um, uh, the First Minister said yesterday there'll be a referendum in 2020. Is that the government's position? No, uh, uh, with respect, she did not say that. But what she said that well, she... Well, it's, not, it's going to be before 2021 and not in 19, 2019, so that means 2020. Uh, no, she said uh, within the term of this parliament, <laughs> the term of this parliament concludes uh, in March, uh, end of March, I presume, uh, 2021, uh, she said in order to protect the mandate which we have, uh, as she would put in place legislation that allowed a referendum to take place should there be a Section 30 order. That's what she said, that's the time scale she put in place. And how many civil servants are working on that plan now? I cannot give you that number, but if you write to me, I'll be quite, quite well, happy. Well, maybe you could just write to us with that number. I, I'd be quite happy to say to indicate to you the arrangements that we will make. And uh, are civil, do you have civil servants working on both the 
um, bill that the First Minister mentioned yesterday and also on another white paper. Um, the bill is fully within the competence of the Scottish Parliament and therefore has been worked on by officials in that way. There is no work being undertaken on a new white paper. So there won't be another white paper? I, I can only tell you that there is no, you've asked about civil servants working on white paper, that is, there is no work on a civil service work on a new white paper. So are there, how many civil servants are working on independence at the moment? Um, I, I, I would have to go and look at the work that's being done by individuals on a range of issues, but the issues of, to which you're referring, for example, the bill, is fully within the competence of the Scottish Parliament. That's not what I asked. I asked about how many civil servants are working on, the, on independence. I, I would have to go and find out what individuals are doing, but I mean, as far as this is concerned, we are operating within, entirely within our mandate and entirely within uh, the way in which we operate. I don't doubt it. I'm just simply asking a factual question. Well, if, uh, if I shall reflect upon that question as well. Well, I'd be grateful if you just furnish the committee with an answer. Um, further to uh, the points that were made yesterday by um, the First Minister on this process, whatever that now uh, means, um, do you have any reflections on your government's response to the Smith Commission, given that was the last time parties came together? Well, I heard um, Mr. Rennie's question about that. Um, I think we took part fully and constructively in the Smith Commission, and that was a process that came to its conclusion. Um, it is very different from the situation we, which we now find ourselves, which is created as a result of Brexit. So when the Deputy First Minister said the day afterwards, actually I think on the day of the publication of the report, it's continued Westminster rule, quote, unquote, that was a constructive contribution to the work that all the parties put in? Well, I don't think it's a reflection in any sense on the work that the parties put in. I mean, well, it's what you know, he said. It's your people, government minister. It's those your people colleague. who know John Swinney know that he is the most constructive individual. Uh, he worked very constructively within the Smith Commission. Uh, he reflected upon what appears to be the truth. So you think it's continued Westminster rule? Well, Westminster rule is what exists. So when the, this parliament sets uh, 20 mile an hour speed limits for local roads, do you think that's continued Westminster rule? No, yeah? I, I, what I've said is, and what John Swinney said is, it is continued Westminster rule. We are, we are part of a system which I pointed out to Mr Green has a sovereign parliament which can veto this parliament, which has vetoed this parliament, which has vetoed this parliament on issues in which you have supported, Mr Scott. So I think that's a reasonable statement to make. And how would the rest of us have confidence in the process you're presumably going to write to us about in, in that context? Because, I, you know, because today is today. Because <laughs> it is... No kidding. Because, no, I'm very serious about this. Because if we are endeavouring to make progress in whatever way, we will have to speak to each other. But you've already I said think the I've been very generous with your time, Mr Scott. So are you coming to a conclusion with your questions? Okay. Um, I want okay. to make sure there's continued dialogue that's being offered... It is an open offer without preconditions, and I really do hope people take it up. Ready? Thank you. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson. Things sacred about the union, it seems, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning. Um, I'm just going to ask you, uh, you've clearly pointed out that we can't negotiate with the EU, um, um, even though apparently we're not under Westminster rule, uh, while this uh, stramash is ongoing. So I'm just wondering what kind of engagement uh, positive, constructive engagement that the Scottish Government is currently having with EU uh, member states? Well, we make sure that there is dialogue that takes place at every level. So, you know, for example, Fiona Hislop will meet with ambassadors and consuls on a, a regular basis. There will be bilateral discussions between ministers on, on issues. Uh, um, we have a very active and extremely able uh, set of officials in uh, Brussels, and we also have good presence in Paris and in uh, Berlin and in Dublin and in London, and those are used greatly to our benefit in terms of having dialogue. This is a productive, positive set of conversations that take place all the time and in a variety of different ways. You are absolutely right to say, though, that, of course, as you know, a part of a member state, we cannot enter into your know, official um, negotiation with the EU or with anybody else on these matters, and that's just the reality. Our relationships evolving. I mean, um, since the, the Brexit situation, you've indicated that, for example, France and other countries have got, now got a different attitude towards Scotland. I'm just wondering if you can tell me if there's been a, a blossoming across the European Union, is it with certain countries, and what nature has that taken? Is it about goodwill? Is, is, the, is Europe now wanting to engage more directly with, with Scotland, uh, given the, the, the vote that we had here, um, which would have kept us in union if we weren't under Westminster control? 
I think that there was, you know, quite clearly during the 2014 referendum, a very strong effort by the UK <coughs> government, by Cameron and others, <coughs> to try and get as negative a view as possible from the EU. And favours were called in. You've got to remember, you know, Cameron wanted favours and favours were called in. I never felt that was particularly genuine. Um, I think what you're now seeing is a reversion to a, an interest in Scotland, a, a view that Scotland has a lot to offer, uh, an acknowledgement that if... Now, this is a really important point. If Scotland chooses to be independent, because it is a choice that only Scotland can make, if Scotland chooses to be independent, then I think it would be welcomed amongst the family of nations and it would be a constructive part of that family of nations. And I don't see anybody that's saying the opposite. Even you know, much as it's, it's sometimes made of the position of the Spanish, you know, the, the, the Spanish government has been very, very clear that if the constitutional road to independence is the road that is walked by the Scottish people, then that will be recognised, and it will not. You know, and the path into the EU will not be blocked. There's never been any doubt about that. You know, and that was reiterated by uh, by the most recent Spanish foreign minister, and will be reiterated by the consul general. You know, people if they ask him that, that's what they will get. So, in those circumstances, there is a positive dialogue. Now, when I go to Brussels, and when Fiona Hislop goes to Brussels, she goes more often than I do. Then there are conversations with a variety of individuals at a variety of levels within the Commission, within individual member states, within the permanent representation, and that is positive, and, and there is a positive discussion of issues. Any country going through the accession process will have to negotiate, will have to indicate what its priorities are, will have to have give and take, genuine negotiation, unlike the type that we've seen uh, that the UK has been doing, and that is what we should do. But I have absolutely no doubt that that is a normal, positive process. And, you know, the point the First Minister made yesterday in her speech was, was, was very telling. You know, a substantial number, almost, you know, I think 11 of the EU member states are of the same size or smaller than Scotland. They went through it. They did it. And probably, and none of them had been members or part of another member for almost half a century. So where's, where's the problem? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, you touched earlier on uh, regarding the situation of the intergovernmental relations, uh, and, uh, and it's been well documented that uh, they don't seem to work at all and very much broken. Um, going forward uh, over the next uh, six months, um, how do you see the, the role of the, the Joint Ministerial Committee, the European negotiations, uh, and also the Ministerial Forum EU negotiations uh, in, with regards to uh, Brexit and, uh, and, and how the Scottish Government are managing to influence uh, what's going on? Well, ourselves and the Welsh Government you know, are, are, are in regular dialogue about this, and it is an issue that has arisen and, and been discussed at the Ministerial Forum and at the JMC, but now it becomes of even greater concern. First of all, you have to accept that there would be a second phase of negotiations, and we don't know that. You know, I mean, you know, it, I think all of us this time a year ago would have been a bit astonished to, to, to discover that you know, still, we were still without any conclusion to that. But if you were to postulate there were a second round of negotiations, then clearly these would be the substantive, detailed and difficult negotiations about the substance of a future relationship. And they are bound to touch upon uh, a, areas of devolved competence. In fact, more than that, areas of devolved competence will be on the table. So the principle that needs to be applied here is that there cannot be negotiation which trades away or affects areas of devolved competence without the decision-making process involving the devolved administrations. The question is how you then convert the decision-making process into the negotiating process. Uh, and that is because the negotiating parties are the UK and the EU. So that's the issue you have to address. And that's the issue that's on the table. There is no resolution of that issue, but it's an issue we're taking forward. It, there have been many warm words over the last two years, two and a half years. Uh, a lot about the, the number of meetings. It's not the number of meetings that counts, it's what happens in those meetings. And most of those meetings have been desperately unsatisfactory. Um, the terms of reference of the JMCEN uh, to discuss each government's requirements for the future relationship with the EU, seek to agree to a UK approach to and objectives for Article 50 negotiations, provide oversight of negotiations with the EU to ensure as far as possible that outcomes agreed by all four governments are secured from these negotiations, and discuss issues stemming from the negotiation process which may impact upon or have consequences for the UK government, the Scottish government, the Welsh government, the Northern Ireland executive. Awful lot of that just hasn't happened. 
And if it is going to happen, then you need to go back to that text and say, how do you make that real in the light of what will be, if these second stage negotiations take place, infinitely more complicated and difficult than what has gone before. So uh, you know, we know where the problem is. We know what, how that problem has to be resolved. There has to be a willingness in the UK government to resolve it in a meaningful way. And we haven't seen that in two and a half years. I mean, that's been the real problem. And it's problem actually, uh, I would say, you know, I won't say I'm entertained by it, but I am certainly struck by the, 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 what is happening with the negotiations, direct negotiations with Labour. They are following a playbook, which I would recognise and the Welsh would recognise very strongly, that you can talk and talk and talk, but you can't get the Prime Minister to the point where she says, I am prepared to look at and reconsider my red lines. And you know, what we've seen all the time is that that talk doesn't touch upon what the UK government has decided to do and intends to do. And can't do, actually, in these circumstances, because it can't get it through. Uh, so I take it that the Welsh uh, government, are they very much in the, uh, the same position as the Scottish government? I don't speak for the Welsh government, but I have to say that our position has been uh, very closely aligned on this issue of what happens next. Uh, you know, and, and both of us have been concerned about it. I, I think Mark may well have raised this over a year ago, you know, and it's been on the table for a long time, but it's not got to any conclusion. So, um, discussions will take place, can, will con I'll continue to take place over the course of the next six months. And if the, oh. and if the, if the Prime Minister... Um, still doesn't want to uh, to give up in any of the of the red lines then what's the point in, in potentially having these discussions over the course of the next six months I don't think there's any point in stopping talking I, I think it's always important to try and keep channels open no matter how difficult I mean you know we've been through this over the last two and a half years I can't say it's always been a pleasant experience I, can't, I really don't know how many miles I've done in, and, and what a cost this has been to the um, a, uh, public purse. But I think you have to keep on talking. Uh, and, you know, and one could draw the analogy here. I think you have to keep on talking across the party divides and we have to keep on talking about it. But it is often frustrating. Uh, the, the, the red lines issue is absolutely crucial. I mean, if you decide upon red lines at a very early stage in their negotiation and you won't change them no matter what happens and you won't negotiate seriously no matter what happens, then you're going to end up in this position, you know, because these red lines dictate the outcome. If you change the red lines, you change the outcome. Uh, and my final question is, you mentioned there in terms of the cost, has there been any estimate uh, undertaken in terms of the, the financial uh, burden that's been placed upon the public purse? We know that the cost of Brexit has been rising steadily. I, you know, cost, I think I saw four billion as an estimate of the New Deal preparations, but no, there has been no quantification of the cost of that, and it is an expensive process. Thank you. Thank you, Ross Greer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to start with the issue of intergovernmental relations, not necessarily not just in the context of Brexit, but also uh, what the First Minister announced yesterday. Um, taking aside the issue of an independence referendum and looking at the other two elements of um, what were announced, is the Scottish Government in a position at the moment to propose new structures for intergovernmental relations, given, I accept what you've said about the review that has been committed to and not actually started yet, but certainly in the medium term and taking the Brexit issue aside, if cross-party talks are to be convened here on a new understanding of what's needed to, to resolve the deficiencies in the settlement, that requires a level of intergovernmental cooperation that will not happen under the current structures. So does the Scottish Government have an idea of what new structures would work for that process? Well, uh I gave a lecture to the Institute for Government about a month ago, uh, which put some suggestions on the table in terms of intergovernmental relations. Um, and you know, there's been work done by the Welsh uh, Assembly Government uh, on this too. They published a paper, I think, in August 2017 on this. There were indications of how devolution might change as a result of Brexit in the first Scotland's Place in Europe paper we published in December 2016. So there's a lot of material in here. And in the light of the intergovernmental review that's taking place, I would anticipate 
us publishing further suggestions for the intergovernmental review. Uh, so th there is a lot of work going on this. I am interested, of course, and I think this is part of the discussion we will now hopefully have with the other parties, parties' views on this, and the First Minister said in her statement yesterday that she would be keen to see if there was a, you know, agreed uh, positions that we could put forward as a, as a parliament to the UK government, uh, and that presumably would be uh, featured in the intergovernmental review. So there, there are some connections here you know, which we, could, we can move forward with. And to, to look at each of the two additional parts individually, and again, moving the referendum issue to one side because of the clear political uh, issues around it, with the inter-party uh, inter, uh, talks, is there an expectation and intention from the Scottish Government to seek the UK Government's buy into that process before or as it begins? Or would the intention be to try and convene the parties here to come up with a collective offer that the UK Government are then approached with? Well, I think we should take this a step at a time. Uh, you know, I, I want to talk to people in the other parties individually about what their expectations would be of how we take it forward, and we'll have that conversation with your party, as I hope we'll have it with other parties. I want to see whether the involvement of, of, of exterior, external med mediation and discussion would be helpful, you know, so that we're not just digging ourselves back into where we all are. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw the STUC reaction to this yesterday, but the STUC reminded us of, the, of Civic Scotland's role and how Civic Scotland might be engaged. Uh, and indeed, you know, I think that other people have commented yesterday on that matter too. So uh, this is you know, a process which we, we should go at carefully and step by step, but I'm not ruling anything out at all. And you know, I hope ownership of it can, can move you know, in a way that we all feel we have something to get from this. Uh, and therefore, I want to do it carefully and, and perhaps not to rush our fences. Um, and essentially the same question in regards to the Citizens' Assembly process. Will you seek to engage with the UK government as you develop the structure, the proposals for that process? I'm not sure I see the link as clearly uh, there. You know, you can make a link between the intergovernmental review and, and what we might discuss parties in Civic Scotland. I'm not sure I see the link as clearly with the the, the, the Citizens' Assembly. What I see with the Citizens' Assembly is that we haven't seen it operate in this way and on this scale in Scotland before. So I would want to make sure that there was, insofar as people wanted to, views from others coming in to influence that process. You know, this is something new. Uh, it's something I think that we, we, should be, we should welcome. There is, a sort of, you know, there is a sort of tradition that we've seen building up in Scotland. You know, if you look at the Constitutional Convention, and the way that that led to the Parliament, and you know, I acknowledge that the SNP was, was not a part of that. You know, and there may there's a historical debate to be had about that. And you know, if you look at the detailed history, you will know where I was in that debate. Uh, you know, uh, sorry, <laughs> you and I are always soulmates, Mr. Uh, Gibson. The um, the you, you, we, there's a tradition in there. I think you can look at this, and what we're talking about now is as being part of that, of building on the tradition and changing and developing the light of, of how uh, your participated democracy has, is changing. And I think that's a positive thing, but we've got to learn about it. So let's, let's think about it, let's get other people's views about it, let's move it forward. Does the government have a, a process in mind for agreeing the structure and the format of the Citizens' Assembly? No. Uh, what I hope to do, however, is, and I think the First Minister made that clear yesterday, is in terms of the bill and in terms of the Citizens' Assembly, certainly, to come back to Parliament towards the end of May with some views and ideas for discussion. Not ex-cathedral pronouncement, but for discussion. You know, we hope to have a bill to publish in the end of May. I mean, we're about to go into Perda for the European Parliament, so you know, there will be a period of things not happening. But you know, I would hope by the end of May we'd be clear on that. But it will be, certainly in terms of the Citizens' Assembly, a work in progress and, and, and people should influence that progress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Annabel Ewing. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, just picking up a, 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 a thread that we, we, the committee was looking at a wee while ago, I, I had uh, just wanted to remind myself, uh, so I, I checked that in terms of um, just looking at the last 15 years, the number of uh, countries which had acceded to the European Union. So I noted that in fact, there were the following. The Czech Republic, Cyprus, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Malta, Poland, 
Slovakia, Slovenia, Bulgaria, Romania, and Croatia. And therefore, I would suggest that perhaps it would be very difficult to find any credible argument to suggest that Scotland would be in a uniquely different position as far as membership of the EU uh, is concerned, and Scotland as an independent country. And I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary uh, would uh, doubtless agree uh, with that. I, think I don't that, think we need to spend time on that. I would agree. Yes, I think that just encapsulates the perhaps uh, uh, ridiculousness of that argument. But turning to another issue, the continuity bill, and I did have the opportunity to ask a few questions yesterday in the Chamber to the Cabinet Secretary about that. Perhaps we could tease out a bit more information. So firstly, uh, I note that the Cabinet Secretary plans to bring forward legislation to ensure that Scots law continues to align with EU law. And perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could provide some more information about what he's thinking, when he intends to do that, what the mechanism would be would be in terms of ensuring that relevant triggers were triggered to alert us to where we needed to, mm -hmm. to take action and so forth. The, the continuity bill has been a, 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 an interesting and difficult experience for the last year and a bit. And the conclusions that I wrote to the presiding officer about some weeks ago were uh, in part the result of discussions between the parties. Um, and I had initially been tempted by a reconsideration phase of the bill that is you know, a part of their standing orders that has never been used before. And uh, as clerks of this parliament will know, I'm sometimes fond of using bits of the standing orders that haven't been touched on before. Um, and it would have been nice to have, to, to have taken forward the reconsideration process. Looking at it closely, I think it does, that part of the standing orders does tend to, 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 to look a little bit like having been written 20 something years ago. It's very restrictive, uh, and I think if we were to simply bring back uh, the bits of the continuity bill that we could bring back, it would be very inflexible. Uh, now, there are bits of the continuity bill that we can bring back uh, in that process, because those are the bits that the, the Supreme Court has agreed we can, we can continue with. Of course, there would be very substantially more. In fact, the whole bill, with one very tiny exception, could have been brought back had the UK government not changed the law Indeed. in a way that they could not have done in the criminal law, but they did constitutionally because there is no court of appeal, as Mr. Green had raised earlier. So that was the problem we had. But we could bring back those parts of the bill. But I think those who discussed this came to the conclusion there probably was a better way to take this forward. One or two things have already moved forward. You know, the, the things have, have changed. Um, if you, as you specifically asked about the keeping pace powers, the keeping pace powers were. Uh, introduced in the Continuity Bill, but not in the UK equivalent legislation. We felt, and the Parliament agreed, that there were places in which that would be useful, environmental law, for example. I think the example I gave in the Stage 2 debates specifically was to do with uh, fish disease, where you know, presently uh, there is an automatic change to the law when the EU identifies a new threat in aqu aquaculture or something, uh, that becomes part of EU law and becomes part of Scots law, so you don't have to keep going back to primary legislation. Uh, it seemed entirely sensible, given the expertise that existed in the EU on this, that we should plug into that and that our legislation should reflect that. And, and uh, there are a variety of places in environmental law that would have been useful, but there may well have been other places. Now, the original proposal we had on the bill was was constrained and you know, entirely properly by the... By the, the um, by the Parliament. I think Mr. Scott was the author of one of the uh, amendments that constrained it because there was a view that it could be misused and more widely used. It may well be that people would have a different view on this occasion. They may they look at it again and say, well, actually, we now see other reasons why this should be used. And that gives us the opportunity to bring it back. So that is something which I think we could usefully legislate on. But if we were to use the reconsideration stage, we couldn't change the proposal as it existed in the, existing, in the, in the bill that went to the Supreme Court. So I think that it, it, just in that one area, it's an example of why we need to bring fresh legislation uh, uh, informed by the change of circumstance. Now, there are a range of other things. Um, you know, the, um, the, the, the uh, human rights issues. You know, we've, since then, we've had the report from Alan <coughs> Miller and his team. There is an indication of, of legislation that would be possible for the Scottish Parliament and useful to have. Uh, how do we bring that in? And the possibility is that we could bring it into that legislation. Now, you don't want to end up with a portmanteau bill, you know, not least because that's not 
legislative possible, that it wouldn't pass. So you need to have a theme and, and a recognition of what we can do. But that is what we are working on. And that is what I think, I'm not trying to put words into the mouth of those who were at the cross-party discussion, but I think that's what they felt in the end would be the most useful thing to do. There were a couple of papers that that group saw from officials which said, you know, this is what's possible. And I think in the end, the conclusion was this was the best way to do it. Okay, but that's, that's very interesting to hear the, the suggested approach. Uh, uh, just two very quick supplementaries, if I may, I understand this is still a member to, to come in. Um, so uh, I, I would imagine, but in these days one never knows, um, that in light of the fact we would be talking about devolved matters, that Westminster would have nothing to do with this and would not be able to put any spanner in the works. Can, um, can well, the Cabinet uh, Secretary provide reassurance on that? Point? I think it would be perverse if you were bringing into the parliament a bill which you know, had elements, the elements within it were matters which had already been considered by the Supreme Court and found to be within the powers of the parliament even after the UK government pokal um, on it. You know, I would have thought that would have been unlikely, but who can tell? You know, we won't legislate on the basis that we're afraid of who's looking over our shoulder. We'll legislate on the basis of what we think is right for Scotland within our legal competence. Okay, and one last question, if I may. Um, do we have an idea of timing yet, when we may expect to see the... I would hope that we would see such a bill in year four, which is the next legislative session. Uh, that would be my intention. Uh, we, we will, I think, end up in this calendar year with the same, roughly the same number of bills going through and receiving assent as we had last year and the year before. I think that's very, uh, well, in a normal year, the year before was, of course, the end of the election year. But, uh, you know, we, we will see and there will be no di diminution of the legislative process. And that's important because we've actually had to add in this year a very, very substantial amount of secondary legislation mm -hmm. for uh, Brexit. And I pay tribute to the committees involved in that. It has been done you know, well, and I pay particular tribute to, the, to those who've been involved in drafting and mm -hmm. preparing this. This has been a we recognise a very substantial additional burden and we've had to make special arrangements to take it through. But I, I would hope that we could bring this in um, and we won't, we won't create, uh, you know, we won't diminish the opportunity for legislating on other things because year four will be a busy year too. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, convener. Cabinet Secretary, you've talked about the frustration of the process and there is no doubt uh, that this parliament feels that, that that has been the case. The Westminster Parliament does the same. Uh, European Commission, European Parliament. The community is of that opinion, no doubt. And also the business community has a feeling on that whole process. So I think engagement that you've already touched on earlier through the session is vitally important, that how we engage uh, with that process uh, from here and how others engage. Uh, and the Scottish Government have a role within all of that as to how they are perceived in the, the process that they take. And you touched on earlier about the, the offices that we have in other parts of, of Europe. You've got a Brussels office, you've got others in, in various capitals. The impact uh, that, that has been seen, uh, it would be good to get a flavour of what the impact the, the Scottish Government have seen in this whole process uh, uh, and, and how that has uh, supported or, or diminished the frustrations that you have uh, uh, dis discussed this morning. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right to draw attention to those frustrations <laughs> and particularly in the business community. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I get this the whole time with people who are unable to plan or unable to put in place what they want to put in place and to invest. Our, I, our offices in Brussels and elsewhere, I think, as a committee, you've visited our office in Brussels and seen the work they're doing. You're very happy that you, you see the work that's being done in other places. Um, their job is to explain an, uh, what we are doing to help and to understand what others are doing. But also, we do everything we can to try and assist on the practicalities. Yesterday morning, I was speaking to a business and academic audience in Edinburgh University about some of the practicalities that we've put in place. And if I might, if you will allow me to just for a moment to talk about those. On the business side, you know, we put, we've, for example, boosted resources for exports and, and put a focus on exports because we need to support those people who will have to change their practices. I think one of the really important things we've done is to prepare for Brexit Toolkit, which Scottish Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland and Highland Islands Enterprise put together, which I launched last September. Uh, it has allowed businesses to 
guide themselves through the process of preparation. Um, it's had a good take up and it's increased very substantially in the last few months. I mean, for example, the UK government has also recognized the difficulty they've had in engaging with business, but this has been a particularly useful tool. We've had additional resources available to, to businesses to, to move forward. Uh, we've kept very close contact with people like Chambers of Commerce, uh, a whole range of business organizations and continue to do so. Um, I think Derek Mackay speaking today, uh, CDI, is he? Um, you know, there's a lot of those things taking place. What we want to do, what everybody wants to do in politics, I mean, there's no, there's no pleasure in insecurity. It was to create security. Mm -hmm. But we also have to say to ourselves, how do you do that for the long term? Mm -hmm. And you, know, you and I will have a different perspective upon that, and that is a legitimate difference to have. I think you have to settle this down into a situation where people uh, are in a relationship of equality, across these islands, that is not, in my view, the present situation. But you and I would not disagree that we should do as much as we possibly can to help and assist. There are some little areas which are difficult in this, which we need to acknowledge. One of them is that when companies look at the situation and say, the only solution we have to the Brexit issue is to move our activities elsewhere, it is not the part of the Scottish state to pay for jobs to leave Scotland. And, and, you know, I've, I've confronted that on a number of occasions. It's a real difficulty. Pharmaceuticals has been a big issue in this. You know, the moving of the European Medicines Agency was a blow. And, not, and there's still no clarity about what associate membership of that would look like. But as you will know, the regulations in that are difficult in terms of testing of, of drugs and medicines. You know, regrettably, one of the real, I use the word charitable, the misleading parts of the 2016 referendum was the view that was promulgated by Michael Gove, amongst others, that a UK medicines agency would mean a faster, better route mm. to medicines approval. He was told at the time by the pharmaceutical industry that was not true, that the pharmaceutical industry would invest in its biggest markets, and therefore, you know, and with the growing together of the regulatory process in Europe and North America, that would be the target market. So if you're going to create new drugs, you do that for the biggest market first, you get that regulatory approval, and then you go for regulatory approval in other markets. And the UK market, less than 3%, would be one of those other markets. Losing the European Medicines Agency adds to that difficulty. So there are industries in which direct aid has been more difficult, but even so, through the Life Sciences Group and other things, lots of work has been done. Derek, I think Ivan McKee yesterday was at a very large life sciences company in, uh, in Shinnan and making absolutely sure that they understood what we were able to do and we understood what they needed us to do. So, so what will the, the Scottish Government prioritise going forward as to where we are at present uh, while we continue through uh, this, this turbulent time, but also what happens after, uh, if we do uh, have that, uh, that Brexit leave situation, and how the government will prioritise the, the way going forward from that? The maximum protection for Scottish interests, Scottish economic, uh, social, cultural interests, the maximum protection and mitigation would be the issue in the event of a Brexit. Mm. But recognising there would be elements in that, particularly of the Brexit that appears to be on the table that would be impossible to mitigate. An example of that is in freedom of movement. Yeah. You know, I mean, the reality of that, speaking as a Highlands and Islands MSP, is, is, is horrific. There are about 20% of the Highlands and Islands workforce will retire in the next five to 10 years. Demographics, we are getting older. That's not a personal remark, it's just right. where we are. We are getting older, you know, the, we are not reproducing enough. Again, that's not a personal remark, it's just where we are. Uh, indeed, uh, I'm not saying that to any other Highlands Islanders members like Mr. Scott, I'm just <laughs> saying what the situation is. You cannot cope with a drop of 20% in your workforce without having a system that allows people to, to come in easily and to take part easily. And a threshold of £30,000 on migration is not that system. So you will end up inevitably with continued depopulation, for example, west to east, which is the, where we are at the present moment, with a decline in services, because services are predicated by having a population. Yes. You know, and, and that's why freedom of movement is not an abstract. It's not, you know, and when I hear the Prime Minister or anybody else saying how glad she is at the end of the freedom of movement, that is a death knell to some Highlands and Islands communities. And that needs to be understood. 
Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Do, do we have a supplementary? No? Uh, Jamie. Yeah. Just a very quick one. Unfortunately, it's about a subject that we previously talked about, but that's fine. Um, it was regarding the um, when we were having a discussion about the continuity bill, um, one of the potential ways forward was, uh, and I'm just reading from my notes here, was agreeing new protocols with the Scottish Parliament to give MSPs more scrutiny over Brexit legislation. I just wondered if you could expand on what that might mean. It's in the briefing paper that I have. It just says, uh, the Constitutional Relations Secretary has said that he will ensure that the Scottish Government will ensure that choices made by the Scottish Parliament are respected by agreeing new protocols with the Scottish Parliament to give MSPs more scrutiny over Brexit legislation. I just wasn't sure what that Well, I mean, I think it, what it relates to uh, is... What document is that in? It's in our uh, spice briefing. Uh, OK. Um, I think what it relates to is the discussions I've had with the uh, Finance and Constitution Committee over the protocols that we put in place for the additional Brexit legislation for Graham Simpson's committee, uh, you know, for... Um, whatever it's called, scrutiny, um, delegated powers, and, delegated law powers and law reform. Uh, we, we put that in place. And thank you for that piece of information. Um, we are committed to renewing those in the light of, if there were continued Brexit legislation, because, you know, there are, I don't think we, we have even quantified how many there are, but there will be a raft, should it happen, of Brexit bills, which would have to repeat and intensify that process. So what we've said is that actually was useful, but it had to be truncated because of the timescale on it. We need to improve it. There was a protocol between the government and the parliament to allow that process to go ahead. I think officials are already working, as far as I'm aware, on a, re we are, on a renewed protocol which will allow even greater scrutiny in those matters. And very helpfully, Ellen has handed me a piece of paper. There are two objectives that need to be met uh, to deliver effective and timely legislation, because there will be a time element on this, and there needs to be transparent scrutiny by the Parliament to hold the Scottish Government to account when consenting to UK mm. Government legislation. So the consent process will be involved in that. Right. So that is, I think, where we are with it. I appreciate that update. I think, I think the reason I ask the question is I think any of the members who are on other committees will know the, 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 the volume of secondary legislation that's coming through and you know, the accompanying paperwork that often runs to the hundreds of pages and it's, it's often very difficult to, to get through uh, the, the research required to be, make any judgments on the instruments as they come through. So that's why I raise it. Thank you. That's why we try to help if we can. <coughs> that volume is not of our making in terms of the Brexit stuff, but we have been aware of that. And, you know, I'm always aware as somebody who's been through the process as a member of a committee that it is difficult for committees to do their own research and individuals to do their own research. But they also have the absolute right to spend as much time as they can on scrutinising it. So we'll try and square that circle. Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much. If I could just wrap up with a couple of questions that are, are directly pertinent to some of the, the committee's work. Uh, you'll be aware, Cabinet Secretary, that the committee conducted last year uh, an inquiry into the Erasmus Plus programme. Um, have you had any indication uh, from the UK government as to whether there will be replacement funds uh, for a f to continue a full Erasmus Plus programme, which, as you're aware, is really important, well beyond the university sector? It is an important issue for us. Uh, we are aware of the value for money exercise that the UK government was undertaking on this and Horizon 2020, amongst other programmes. Uh, we understood at a stage of this that the value for money process had concluded that Erasmus Plus was not a project that, which was deserving of continued support under the value for money criteria. We've tried to influence those criteria and, and uh, made it very clear that we think the criteria have been flawed in terms of the consideration. There is a slight difference in, in, in attitude towards this north and south of the border. If you look at the university sector, some of the university sector is not terribly happy about Erasmus because it, it deprives them of fees. It, 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 but in Scotland, the situation is different. But overall, I'm, I'm not happy with the way that this has been taken forward by the UK government. So our view is the Erasmus Plus needs to continue. Um, that appears to be the unanimous view of, this, of the various sectors in Scotland. I was speaking yesterday to um, Fiona uh, Butcher, who, who many of you know in terms of lifelong learning, uh, you know, and that they have made extensive use of Erasmus Plus in terms of lifelong learning and are very concerned about the issue. And I have a, a you know, particular interest in, 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 in lifelong learning as a result of which you know, we are very supportive, they're supportive, the, 
the Scottish Funding Council has been supportive, the higher education, further education sectors, the youth sector has been supportive, so we'll continue with that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, it's very concerning that you say that you've been told that um, the UK government said that Erasmus Plus didn't fit its value for money criteria. We, we picked up a, a little bit of that informally when we were in, in, in Brussels. Uh, do you have that in writing? Do you have anything formal that confirms that? I don't think so, but what we do have is a, an understanding that this will be decided on in the next phase of negotiations. Quite clear there's a future relationship issue, so we will continue to influence it. The committee might want to take actions that allowed it to do so too. Yes, okay, thank you very much for that. Um, and another area of work that the committee is about to undertake is a, a, a look at the external relations policy uh, of the Scottish Government. Um, I know it's slightly straying out with, out with your area, but I wondered if you were able to, to touch on um, what impact the Scottish Government's European Union office in Brussels, for example, will suffer as a result of Brexit and what the Scottish Government's priorities will be in terms of setting aside the constitutional issues we discussed earlier, uh, but what the Scottish Government's priorities will be in terms of its relationship with EU and EU institutions after Brexit should You are asking me to, to, to <laughs> step outside the area for which I am responsible. I do think it is important that the, uh, Fiona Hislop is given the opportunity to, uh, to, to talk to you about that. This is in, within her area of responsibility. I can say that I think that the role of the Brussels office becomes ever more important. Uh, and uh, should we leave the EU, then I think there is a very clear agreement that we will have to continue to invest and continue to prioritise the work they do. You know, it, there will be a clear and substantive difference between being one, even part of one of the 27, and being a third country, part of a third country. There's no doubt about that. And therefore, what we will have to do is to find ways to mitigate that damage that will be done, to maintain our voice and to keep our ears open, which is things that they do, uh, and to promote and, and, and protect Scottish business and, and industry through those offices. This will be true in Dublin, this will be true in um, Berlin, this will be true in Paris. So we will need to carry on and intensify our work. But the detail of that, the priorities set for it, are for my colleague, and I'm sure she will be delighted to talk to you about it. Can I thank you very much for coming to give evidence to us today, Cabinet Secretary, and to your officials. And we shall now move into private session. Thank you.